Alright, just a quick update on this um, iPod Nano installation. Um, hopefully we should have production boards in next week, so I'm just doing a bit of testing. Um, the installation consists of 70 vertical strips. Now, this is one vertical just laid out on the bench. I've just folded it with a um, piece of cable because my uh, bench isn't long enough. But there's basically five of the bo these boards, each board having eight screens, um, and they'll be in one long vertical strip. Um, at the top there's a connector board that transitions the, um, these little 2mm connectors into a, um, a ribbon cable. Um, the main reason for using ribbon just simply is it's easy to make the cables up. And the bottom end there's a, uh, a mechanical piece that's also got a, um, a termination resistor. And this ribbon cable comes out of one of these um, data and power splitter boards, which I'll go into in a minute. And that's then in turn driven from um, one of these four port Easy Sync USB high speed to quad 485 boards with just a, a breakout board that I've stuck on the middle to um, send four lots of 485 down a uh, single Cat5. This board does a few things. Um, there's a total of 70 of these vertical strips in the installation. Obviously we don't really want to have 70 RS485 buses because that would be ridiculous. So what each of these boards drives five units and um, because we're driving quite a large number of loads there's 40 um, receivers per segment. We're actually having to split that and um, provide a buffer for each each segment. Um, so each of these five connectors drives one strip and we've got a, a big polyfuse to protect the cabling against the power supply. Um, there's an RS485 driver which is, again has got its own protection. There's a couple of zeners and a couple of polyfuses to protect the zeners against shorts between the uh, data lines and the 24 volt supply which can happen because of these, um, these little 2mm connectors. If these get mated yeah, offset then we can quite plausibly have 24 volts going up the um, data line so we don't want that to cause any damage. There's a little bit of power management going on here, there's a, a 12 volt switching regulator that is to provide power because we may need some um, local, small fans for cooling locally so there's a 12 volt fan supply and then there's the from that we get the um, 5 volt supply for the, the, this buffering stuff. The receiver, this is actually quite a neat device um, I've used a few times, it's from a company called NVE and it's a magnetic isolator that has a completely passive input stage. So basically the front end of this is basically a coil, so this means it needs no ground referencing which firstly means you don't need any, you, know, you don't need any ground so you don't need to, to use an isolated box at the other end to avoid any ground loop effects, but also means just you know, uh, on a more simple level you can get four um, four complete buses down a single Cat5 because you don't need that ground return. One disadvantage of this is it's basically one way so we're only sending data out to these. We now, although technically these boards do have a, uh, a data return path, uh, we're actually not using that. Um, one problem with RS-485, trying to buffer that by direction is deciding you know, which side is transmitting at any given time and, and um, enabling the driver in the right direction. Now in principle we could have done this but this splitter would basically have had to have knowledge of the command protocol and actually decoded the data, worked out the direction from that and decided which of these sort of five buffers to enable the data back from. So um, basically the only, pretty much the only thing we need data back for is when we're programming the flash because we've got an unpredictable read time but because we're going to be programming different content into each of these displays and there's going to be um, 160 display displays on each bus. In practice, what we can do is we can send sort of a block of basically the, uh, the onboard processor handles some of the programming arrays. So we send a 4K chunk of data, and the processor there sits programming and then erasing as required to program that data in, which can take up to um, sort of 100 milliseconds or so. But because we're programming so many, what we can do is we can send a block to each one in turn. And then by the time we've got to the back to the first one, we know that erase time is going to happen purely because of the amount of time it takes to send all that 4K of data to all 160 nodes. So we don't really need that return path. So we can simplify our data into basically a one-way stream. So our splitter is literally just the dumb splitter. It's a receiver, and then it just sends that same data out in parallel over five different buses, which just makes life a bit easier. And it's fewer things to go wrong, fewer things where, you know, whenever you've got something in the middle having to handle the data, it's yet another thing that if you have you know, problems, it can be a real nightmare to debug to actually figure out exactly where the problem's happening if you've got some data getting lost somewhere along the line. So having this as just a dumb buffer just eliminates one uh, possible source of problems. Now, a while ago I did a video on using PCBs as front panels for sort of for making sort of quite nice looking low volume things without the tooling of um, printed and cut front panels. Um, this splitter, uh, we were originally going to put it in this DIN rail housing so it could either be clipped to DIN rail or panel mounted, but as it turned out um, we were a bit short on um, depth. So what I ended up doing was 
um, doing this so that we've got all the connectors on one side, all the um, other stuff surface mount on the other side. And I've just got some frames cut from this is 3.2mm PCB material and a, a rear cover. And this thing isn't going to be seen, this is going to be hiding in a cable trough. Um, but obviously you need protection for those, those components, they don't get bashed when it's being installed. So this just forms a simple sandwich casing, so everything's nice and protected. Um, but it's you know, nice and thin. Uh, we've also got these feet on it because this is going to be sitting in a cable trough and there's going to be cable sitting on the bottom so having these feet means this thing can actually sit on the bottom of the trough but without having to mess about uh, moving the cables either side of it and there's a couple of holes there in case you want to cable tie the uh, data. And so basically four of these sit on one Cat5 cable and the way the data is basically tapped off for each unit is that the pairs effectively step over from into it, so the data comes in on four pairs. It takes one pair off to drive this board, and then it steps the remaining three across by one set, so that the next one that's plugged in in line goes on the next pair. So what we need to do is just plug all these, yeah, four of these in a chain, and then each one will take data from its pair in the uh, incoming Cat5 cable. So we don't have to, for example, have any addressing or any selection on here. So again, it just keeps the installation uh, nice and simple. And it means that, for example, if one of these needs to be re replaced, we just unplug it and plug another one in. Um, and there's no addressing to uh, set up, so that, that keeps keeps things nice and simple. Um, there's a slight fail on the uh, legend here because at a fairly late stage I decided this thing needed to go the other way up and when I rotated all the text I forgot to uh, recenter that because I was looking at it from this side of the PCB so it was a bit hard to see but um, never mind no one's going to see it so uh, not too big a problem. Now because we wanted to keep this thing low profile I, I wanted to use a horizontal socket so we've got horizontal entry, Cat5s and horizontal um, power connector in there. Um, one thing I really struggled with, obviously these, um, I'm using shielded cat fives purely because we've got a solder tab to actually solder them down so they're not they're nice and solid. And obviously it needs to be the type that actually has the tab on the top side because otherwise you wouldn't be able to release it by get, getting on the bottom side. And I really had trouble finding a Cat5 connector with, with tab up that didn't have these shielding things. So obviously if you're using it like this, these things are a pain in the ass because they'll get caught. And uh, I ended up using one by, I think, Stuart, which is quite expensive. I was really surprised how hard it was to find just, you know, one of these without the shielding lugs. It was a real pain, but um, found it in the end and uh, so I just had to pay, I think it was about two quid each or something ridiculous. Um, there's a couple of uh, status indicators, there's a power on and a data light that just flashes, it's actually just connected to the uh, output of the uh, 485 receiver. These actually use through board LED, so these are actually just LEDs that are designed to mount upside down and shine um, through a hole in the PCB. Uh, it's always handy just to have these little diagnostics when you're sort of trying to debug a big installation. Now a few people um, asked about how the IDs work on this system after my uh, last video. Um, what happens is we've got an RS-485 bus that's connected to all these units in parallel. There's also a single data line that goes from one to the next in a chain. And basically what happens is when each thing boot, boots up, it looks at the level of that um, line. Now if it's high, um, above um, yeah, fairly close to 3 volts, it assumes that it's connected to the previous one. And at the beginning of the chain, um, there's actually a resistor to ground, and so on each of these channels there's one resistor which is a different value for each channel, um, and there's a pull-up resistor on the input, so if it sees anything below sort of hard pull-up it says, oh okay, I'm the first one, you know, I'm the one right at the top of the chain, measures the value of that resistor, and depending on the value of that resistor will group itself as to start at either be 141, 81, 121 or 161. And when it's figured that out, it then sends a serial byte down the chain. So each one receives that, says, OK, you know, for example, if this one was 41, then it would send 42 down here. This is say, oh, it would receive that byte um, through a UART and say, OK, I'm 42, and then forward 43 down. So yeah, you know, the whole string will basically address itself. One major issue with big installations like this is you don't really want to be messing around having to program IDs on individual things. You know, you're in a fairly sort of stressful install situation. If you've got a problem, you want to just swap a board out and not worry about it. So this system, you know, just handles all those IDs as long as you you, know, you plug the right ribbon cable into the right connector. Um, the entire string will have its correct ID. So that, that that's quite a neat system for dealing with that sort of um, situation. I mentioned the um, termination resistor at the bottom. And I've got quite a good illustration of here why, of why that's important. See what happens if I disconnect it. Now, um, what I'm doing, I'm actually, instead of reading from Flash, which I was doing earlier, I'm actually sending the data directly. So we're sending a lot of data and we can easily see any corruption. But what's happening is 
the corruption is actually happening at the beginning of the chain, not at the end. So all the ones further down are still working fine. But it's only the ones which are near the beginning of the chain, in fact, as you get near the beginning of the chain it actually gets worse. So what's going on there? Right, to understand what's going on here we need to look at the scope. So the top waveform, this is one of the two RS-485 lines as it's fed in at the top of the chain. And this is what it's like when it comes out the bottom. Um, and I've actually set the grid up to so that one grid division represents the delay between the top and the bottom. Um, so yeah, this 485 bus acts like a transmission line, so we get a delay along it um, of about 110 nanoseconds. So what we can see here, we've got the signal going in, and then we can see this bounce here. Now what's happening if I disconnect the termination, two things happen. Um, the amplitude of this increases a little bit because you know, the termination acts as a load, so there's just a resistive effect. But we see this bump here gets much more pronounced. What this actually is, this is actually a reflection. So our signal goes in, reaches the bottom, and then it starts bouncing back up the line. And if we look at the delay from, you know, from start to the end, and then the same amount of delay, that's where we're seeing this big hump here. So without the termination, the signal reflects off that, that open end and then by the time it gets to here it's, it's basically adding to the, um, the signal that's being sent to provide to produce this peak and this, you know, this can cause all sorts of problems um, with the actual overall signal. You know, it's trying to establish a sort of sensible level to slice this to get a um, recover the data but if you've got this massive great sort of shark fin on top of it then that, that's going to ruin your day. So if I turn the... what happens is if I by turning, turning the termination on, it's absorbing some of that spike at the, um, at the end of the line and significantly reducing the amplitude of this in proportion to the overall signal. And in fact, without the termination, you can actually see there's actually a, a third bounce. So it goes from the beginning to the end. Then this is the bounce at the beginning. And then we've got this peak here, which is it bouncing again, yet again down to the, um, the far end. So, um, and obviously because of this bounce time is of a similar order to our data bit time. You know, if that reflection comes in roughly when we've got a bit transition, then that's going to send all our, all our um, signal lines hay haywire. So, you know, once you get up to systems that have got either a fairly long cable length or, you know, quite a lot of, because we've got, you know, these PCB traces are, or where we've got sort of long PCB traces, these obviously, you know, zigzagging around the, around the, um, around here and also around the edge of the PCB, we've got the distributed load of the, um, RS-485 receivers providing some sort of capacitive load, then you know pieces of wire start acting as sort of series inductors, and you get all sorts of um, interesting effects. So, yeah, you know, while in quite a lot of situations you can ignore termination, there are certain situations where it can actually be quite important to the point you know, where the thing will actually stop working if it's not terminated properly. And yes, folks, there are a couple of minor little fails on this board layout, and that one was me not really reading the microchip data sheet. This is a MCP16301 buck converter which I use all the time but I almost always use it for 5 volts but when you're outputting more than 5 volts you actually need a zener in there to um, avoid the uh, voltage smoking the chip basically so that was a little uh, error and a minor pinout fail on this converter I actually cross-checked uh, this PCB against another PCB I then remembered that other PCB was also wrong but the other one I didn't actually need to fix because I could just swap the wires around at the, at the far end so um, Fortunately there's only uh, 14 of these, so it's not a big deal to fix that, but um, this is all all working, so hopefully we should be aiming to do a full-up test of this in the next few days, which should be uh, quite fun if we can find the space to do it.